Rabbi Daniil Hartman. Good afternoon. God spoke to Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, you shall be holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. With that statement, our tradition tried to create something that ought to be at the foundation of all of our denominations. Doesn't matter whether you're orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, renewal, post-denominational, secular. I think I got everyone. Doesn't matter. To be a Jew at its core means to, be, to continuously aspire to that which you will never achieve. It's not about feeling guilty. It's not about being frozen and saying, ugh, I'm never going to be good enough. It's not about feeling engulfed in a notion of original sin. It's about saying, God is not only one, God is radically other, but you have to spend your life trying to get close. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Aspirational Judaism is the core denomination of Jewish life. It's a denomination in which mediocrity in Judaism is a contradiction in terms. It's a denomination in which you wake up in the morning and ask yourself, how could I build something better than yesterday? And how could tomorrow be better than today? What values? What ideals, what principles have to define me as a Jew? I aspire to be an aspirational Jew. I am an aspirational Zionist. The essence of aspirational Zionism is no different than aspirational Judaism. It asks, how do I get up in the morning and make sure that today is better than yesterday and ask myself the question, what do I have to do tomorrow? I love living in Israel. I love Israel. I find it an honor to live there, to raise my children there, and now also to raise my grandchild there. It's not always easy. My family, like most Israelis, have paid a very, very heavy price for living in Israel and for loving Israel. The rabbinic tradition teaches us that one of the great tragedies of life is that everything of value, any great value or blessing, always comes with hardship. And Israel is no different. We've all paid a price. But I could choose or think of no other place that I would rather live and raise my family. But my love of Israel is not exhausted only by what it is. And I love it for what it is. We're soon going to have Pesach. We're a people who learn how to sing Dayenu. We sing Dayenu, but there's a little catch to the song Dayenu. It's a little contradiction. If we were really serious about the song, it would have only one line. <laughs> right? It's like, we're happy, but. <laughs> I want a little more. Dayenu and Dayenu and Dayenu and Dayenu, and it becomes quite a long song. I love Israel for what it is and I'm aware of all the difficulties, its greatness and its failures, and I love it all. But my deep love of Israel is not merely exhausted by what Israel is and what it has achieved, but my deepest love is about what it can be and asking myself what values and ideals 
have to define a Jewish homeland? And what do I have to do to help make that a reality? As you all know, we, our generation, we're the first Jews of choice. We're the first ones who don't have to be Jewish. We don't. There's nothing forcing us to be Jewish. We have a real, real crisis. And that is that the outside world doesn't hate us enough. And it's difficult. Because if they don't hate us enough, they don't serve as a safety net ensuring that I stay inside. They don't remind me of who I am if I don't want to be who I am. As Jews of choice, we know that a Judaism of mediocrity is not merely a tragedy, but a Judaism of mediocrity is a catastrophe and a death sentence. A Judaism which is not compelling is not going to actualize and activate the choice of Jews to stand up and say, I want to be a Jew. An Israel of mediocrity is no different. I believe that Israel is an essential, critical, important part of building a meaningful Jewish life for Jews in Israel and for Jews around the world. But I can't just declare it, demand it, and go home. I have to earn it. Just as Judaism must earn the choosing of the Jews, so must the future of loving Israel earn that love. And that's much more difficult. Now, how do we do that? We need to learn to develop a new conversation around Israel. Not necessarily we in this room, we in this room, and we outside of this room. A conversation in which Jewish values and Jewish ideals defines us and challenges us to ask not merely what we criticize, but what do we want to build? Not merely what's wrong with them, but how do I take responsibility? We need to develop a nuanced language of values, which looks at the complexity of Israel and asks, how do we build a homeland for the Jewish people in a real world, in a difficult, crappy neighborhood? What do we do? How do we maintain our aspirations? What do we stand for? I don't have the time, even though I'd love to, speak very, you know, at great length and model what these type of, or what this type of value conversation may look like. But I'd like to just very briefly, let's take one of the more difficult ones. One that is so essential to Judaism and so essential to Israel and which needs to be nuanced if we're going to be lovers of Israel. Because if your values aren't nuanced, you'll, be, you'll sort of drown in criticism all the time. And you'll create us and them. And you'll sit down together and speak about us who get it and they who don't get it. An essential part of Israel and Zionism and sovereignty is power. You can't be a sovereign people without power. Now, how do we Jews think about power? On the one hand, power is an essential feature of what it means to be a human being. When God creates human beings and says, you rule the world and master it, you be the demigods, in essence, replacing me. In Genesis, God creates God's replacement and says, it's your world. Rule it and master it. And with that, God gives us the blessing and the responsibility of power a power which we must use to rule this world, a power which we must use to be able to institute tikkun olam, but also a power which we must use in order to live. In our tradition, protecting oneself is not amoral, 
is not immoral. Protecting oneself is one of the highest moral responsibilities that one has. We don't love human beings in general and despise ourselves. And I know it doesn't play that well in a movie. It's much nicer being the heroic one who dies for others. It's a great ending. It's the movie that you remember. But let me just do a little exercise for one moment and see if you're like most other groups in our community. Let's take the greatest dyer in Jewish history for a moment. It was the person who led the revolt in Masada. By a show of hands, and don't worry, it's not a test. Who remembers the person who was played by Peter Strauss in the movie? What's his name? The greatest dyer in Jewish history. Look around for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. How do you think he feels right now? <laughs> Elazar ben Yair. None of you even know his name, or some of you. Most do not, because in our tradition, we have an obligation to live v'chai b'hem. To live is a Jewish value. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love of others starts with love of self. Self-defense is a moral obligation. And so we embrace power and we take a trip up Masada, we might sweat a little bit. But when we say never again, we don't simply say that Masada will never fall again. We say that's not our path. We choose to live. And as a sovereign people, sometimes we have to fight. But the thing about power is that it's essential to be, to being and fulfilling our human destiny. But power is also never an end unto itself. We yearn for a day when we won't have to use it. We struggle with the question of how you use it justly. We ask, what are its limits? And yes, we ask, at what moment should I choose death rather than using it? Not as a theoretical exercise, but as a question that I ask myself and a question that I ask my son to ask himself. Not in theory. At what moment do you not shoot? At what moment do you take a chance? We need a very sophisticated, nuanced conversation, for example, about power, about a Jewish state, about democracy, about state and religion. Building a sovereign Jewish country requires of us nuance, requires of us a conversation where the purpose of that conversation is not to feel good about oneself. The purpose of that conversation is to try to actualize these values in our lives. It's to be part of the solution. It's not to disenfranchise. It's not to disengage but it's a conversation that will unite Jews worldwide in building a new Jewish country, an aspirational Zionism. Now, aspirational Judaism is relatively easy. It's easy because it's up to us. Who do you want to be? Have you had enough with mediocrity? What type of Judaism do you want to have? How do we build a community with a wide enough bandwidth to even hear Jewish values? A wide enough bandwidth to learn Jewish values? A wide enough bandwidth in which we build institutions that are meaningful and powerful and compelling? It's up to us. We could do anything we want in aspirational um, Judaism. Our problem is not a poverty of resources. It's a poverty of vision. We could do it if we want to. Aspirational Zionism, however, is much more complicated for two key reasons. The first is that unlike aspirational Judaism, in aspirational Zionism, it's not only up to us. There's somebody else. 
and one of the essential features of Israel and of loving Israel is to recognize that one of my values is to live in the real world. Part of what Zionism means, part of what Israel has done is it has brought, it has brought us back into the world. It has brought us back into realpolitik. It's brought us back into politics and I want to stay there. But to build the Israel that I yearn for, the Israel that I dream about, it's not only up to me. Now there's a lot of things that I have to do and I will never be quiet. I will never be silent as long as there's something that I have to do but I know that it's not only up to me. There's another side who also has to be aspirational. And it's also difficult because the environment of fear and an environment of war, it's sometimes difficult to be aspirational. I remember every third weekend welcoming my son home. And he spent three years on checkpoints in the West Bank. And he had five seconds, ladies and gentlemen. That's five seconds. He had five seconds in which he had to figure out if the person coming to him was overdressed because they were overdressed or whether they were overdressed because they wanted to kill him. He just had five seconds and he wasn't 30 and he didn't have a doctorate in ethics. He's a little pisher. It's my son, he's 18 years old. 19 years old and he's scared and he wants to come home and I want him to come home. It's difficult to be aspirational in our neighborhood but because it's difficult doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. That's our destiny. To be an aspirational Zionist is to be an aspirational Zionist in the Middle East, not in Washington DC alone. That's where it counts. But it's difficult. And I need you to forgive us a little bit. We have to forgive each other a little bit. It's difficult. And it's not, as I said, always up to us. But there's another reason why aspirational Zionism is difficult. Because we don't agree on what those aspirations are. There's a lot of us who could love peace and love democracy and aspire for values, but we could disagree as to how that ought to be implemented in real life. Do we do a unilateral withdrawal from the West Bank? Do we not? What should the borders be? How much risk should we take for the sake of peace? Our debate is, it's nice and comfortable to think that our debate is between people who disagree with us fundamentally about our values. Very often what makes aspirational Zionism so difficult is that we're disagreeing with people who fundamentally agree, but we disagree on the weight, on the balance, on how to implement them. Now when it comes to aspirational Judaism, we also disagree, but that's relatively easy. Because we know how to build, while we're one people, we know how to build parallel Judaisms. Each one of us has our aspirations, we build our own shul. And if you don't agree with my value, build a different shul. I don't want you to come to my shul. I don't want to go to yours. Part of my identity is not going to yours. And that's okay. When it comes to Judaism, the space, the, 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 the institution of synagogue life and denominations allows for difference in which if we disagree, you build your space. But when it comes to aspirational Zionism, what am I supposed to say? If you disagree with me, what? Build your own country? Israel is the shared enterprise of the Jewish people. We are stuck together. It's all of ours. Whether we like it or not, the people at the table aren't the people who agree with us. They're also the people who disagree. That's the essence of Zionism. It's about our decision not to be a shul only, but to be a people and to build something together. And I can't walk away from you. So how do I function? How do I allow my aspirations not just to be criticism, but to be a force for action 
knowing fully well that I don't get to decide alone and I can tell you to leave the table. I'd like to end by teaching a Kabbalistic principle taught in Lorianic Kabbalah. They asked a simple question. If God is the infinite, there's no room for anybody else. Infinite, you take up all the space. Lorianic Kabbalah had a brilliant idea. They said in the act of creation, God contracts God's self. The term is tzimtzum. God contracts God's self to make room for the world. If we're going to learn to love Israel together, we're all of us going to have to learn the art of tzimtzum. We're going to have to contract in order to live with the person who we disagree with contract our anger, contract our frustration, and yes, even contract our certainty. That's the hardest. And then contract our language to create a language in which we don't vilify, in which we don't insult, in which we allow somebody to be a carrier of values and to have a life of value, even if they don't necessarily agree with me. As a rabbi, I'd like to wish all of us, give all of us a bracha for one moment. My bracha to all of us is that in the spirit of our tradition, we'll have the courage to walk in the ways of God. You shall be holy. I yearn to be holy. And may all of us try to be holier tomorrow than we are today. Try to have a life slightly more valuable tomorrow than we had today. But I also want us to walk in the ways of God through Tzim Tzum. Let's contract. Let's learn how to share. Let's learn to love Israel and to love each other. And if we walk in the way of God, maybe, maybe, we will be able to build a deeper Jewish life and a greater Israel. And together, we will open a new chapter in Jewish history. Amen and thank you.